Welcome back to The Damage Report. I am Ravana filling in for John Idarola, and we've got a really great show for you today. We're going to be talking about the increasingly hilarious attacks on Representative Matt Gates coming from inside his own party. We're going to talk about Trump's self-victimization with his current fraud trial that's happening in New York. We're going to talk about the impacts, the real life impacts of libs of TikTok amplifying conspiratorial messaging around teachers who are part of the LGBTQ community or just support the LGBTQ community. We're also going to talk about how your life might be worse and your life expectancy specifically might be worse if you're living in a Republican led state. So all that and more coming up on the damage report and joining me to talk about all of that is Ida Rodriguez, who is someone I've been watching on TYT for a long, long time. So I'm really excited to finally get to do a show with you. Hi, same here. I appreciate (laughs) that. I'm happy to be here today of all days because as you said, there are some hilarious things to talk about. <laughs> so with that, let's just jump right into this first story because there is chaos in the Republican Party. Everybody take a look. Uh, a lot of people have been calling me about speaker. All I can say is we'll do whatever is best for the country and for the Republican would, Party. Would you, so you the the would you take the job? Would you take the job? We have some great, great people. Would you take the job? A lot of people have asked me about it. I'm focused. You know, we're leading. I don't know you. I'm sure you don't read too much in the papers. But we're leading by like 50 points for president. Now, my focus is totally on that. If I can help them during the process, I would do it. But we have some great people in the Republican Party that could do a great job as speaker. The new competition amongst House Republicans for who will be speaker has kicked off with a bang. A lot of people floating Donald Trump's name. So there you saw him addressing those rumors. And you know what? If being Speaker of the House means that Donald Trump has to drop out of the presidential race, God bless him. Let it happen. (laughs) If it make him weaker and easier to take out of power, he'd have no direct control of the military, then I'm all for it. Although I don't think that Donald Trump isn't is going to become Speaker of the House. Now let's take a closer look at who might become Speaker of the House, who's thrown their name in the ring, who's vying for that position, and you know what evil Republican ghoul we might see ascend to that role. So CNN reported that House Majority Leader Steve Scalise and Representative Jim Jordan both jumped into the race Wednesday to become the next House Speaker. The stakes are extremely high as Congress faces down a looming shutdown deadline in mid-November. The House is essentially paralyzed while it lacks a speaker. Now, a lot of people believe that because he is the House Majority Leader, Steve Scalise is going to become Speaker of the House. He's ahead in the betting odds right now, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, But there are some concerns as he's currently fighting cancer that he might not be up for the job, although he says that his doctors are very optimistic about his chances of fighting that. Now, I also mentioned Representative Jim Jordan. And if you're wondering if his involvement in covering up sex abuse while he was working at a university is going to impact his chances on becoming the Speaker of the House, I would venture that they're probably not because he was allowed to rise to the position of the head of the House Judiciary Committee. So clearly the Republican Party has decided they don't care about that blemish on his background and allowing him to join the leadership in the first place. Now, those two are not the only people vying for the position and there's still time for other Republicans to jump in the race. Now, one of those Republicans is Representative Kevin Hearn, who has publicly considered joining but hasn't officially. Now, Republicans are hoping to have a candidate and to hold the full House vote by this next Wednesday. Although given the absolute state of disarray that they're currently in. My money is on that not happening. But speaking of money and what I mentioned earlier, let's bring up these betting odds, which just for the record, who the hell are the people that bet on this kind of stuff? But they have the odds in first place currently is Steve Scalise with Kevin Hearn coming in second, Jim Jordan after that. You'll see down there, Donald Trump and Hakeem Jeffries currently have the same 5% chance of becoming speaker. And then as well as Byron Donalds, who you might remember from the first 15 rounds of votes for the speaker. Um, Now, personally, I'm not a betting woman, but I would 
put my money on Steve Scalise becoming Speaker of the House. Ida, do you have any predictions on who might become the Speaker? Or, you know <laughs> how long it might take them to to finally get this done? You know, the way that our American government is going, I mean, Homer Simpson could actually be the Speaker of the House in America because this is a clown show. And it has become, you know, so laughable that it makes me concerned about how we look to the rest of the world and how dangerous that is when they mm-hmm. they see how vulnerable we are. The fact that Donald Trump um, probably doesn't know that he can't do both. Um, because he thinks he's one of those guys that thinks he can do everything. He's like the Tyler Perry of government. He's like, <laughs> I'll direct it, I'll write it, I'll star in it, I'll produce it. Damn it, I'll hold the lights. So, you know, it's very uh, discouraging to see people who have covered up sex scandals, people who lack integrity. Mm-hmm. I would like to see the Republicans who have maintained faith and, and integrity and have not allowed themselves to be bought or bullied to step up in these moments. And I don't know, I don't know who I can name, but can you think of someone? And if you're out there watching, please send me a message, you know, <laughs> put it in the chat. Who do you think? What Republican candidate, what Republican representative has maintained their integrity throughout these last couple of years that you you would say would be a good uh person to open their mouth and speak on behalf of government? Please let me know because I'm lost right now. And you think that there should be at least one person whose name comes like to the forefront of your mind. I can't think of a single one. And even if there was one, they'd still have to contend with the fact that there's this, you know, small coalition of Republicans led by Matt Gates who are <laughs> so beholden to everything Donald Trump wants. I mean, they're they're like washing his feet. <laughs> so to speak, Mm -hmm. in carrying water for him, that they wouldn't even allow someone who's maybe opposed Donald Trump as president to get that role. That person would have to, you know, work with the Democrats, which apparently is 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 a no go in the Republican Party. Now you could be deposed as speaker for even considering doing that. Let's take a look at this first video because the criticism is coming from inside his own house. The people who were masquerading as fiscal conservatives really, really aren't, Jake. I mean, Matt Gates, it's to say he came here as a fiscal crusader, it's more likely he came here for the teenage interns on Capitol Hill, to be honest. Look, he, he's voted for continuing resolutions, he's voted for omnibus bills, he voted for trillions of dollars in COVID spending. Even this year, he put forward an earmark, and yet he's presented himself as, I'm doing this for the fiscal benefit of the country. That's not honest. The guy just had a distaste for Kevin and used the rules to dethrone him. Wow. He came here for the teenage interns on Capitol Hill. And that is a criticism coming from his own party. It's funny to see, though, how none of these Republicans had anything to say about Matt Gates's sexual impropriety before he opposed the party leadership. It would have been nice if someone would have come forward and, and tried to raise the alarm on what we know is Matt Gates's inappropriate behavior with particularly young women, allegedly as young as 17 <laughs> but uh, you know that's a talk for another day now let's call them children though let's call them children let's call them what they are cuz right. the young women we uh you know we we kind of normalize but those are children mm-hmm. those are people who are who can't vote mm-hmm. those are those are people whose parents have to make medical decisions for them those are children Yeah, and those are yeah people who Matt Gates has fought to ensure they're not allowed to make their own medical decisions. But he thinks that that's it's fine to have sex with people that young and allegedly cross borders of states with people that young with the intent to do that to have sex with them, which is a crime that he has been investigated for, by the way, allegedly because he hasn't been formerly indicted for such things. But there has been an investigation into that. Now, clearly, because the Republicans are talking about these things, he's burned his bridges in the GOP. So the question is now, is there a path forward for him to get back in their good graces? Or is this the start of his Madison Cawthorn arc? And if we're going by what Senator Mullen is saying, it seems like it's the latter. Let's watch. 
You got to think about this guy. Um, this is a guy that didn't have that the media didn't give a time of day to after he was accused of sleeping with an underage girl. And there's a reason why no one in the conference came and defended him because we had all seen the videos he was showing on the house floor that all of us had walked away of the girls that he had slept with. He'd brag about how he would uh, crush ED medicine and 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 chase it with um, with an energy drink so he could go all night. This is obviously before you got married, and so when that accusation came out no one defended him and then no one on the media would give him a time of the day all of a sudden he found fame because he opposed the speaker of the house back in november and he's always stayed there and he's not he was never going to leave until he got this last moment of fame now so there was an ethics probe back in 2021 and this was one of the things that was brought up at the time we have this headline from uh cnn gates showed nude photos of women he'd slept with to lawmakers sources tell cnn so if you have <laughs> any questions as to how matt gates views women it's definitely as objects for him to conquer and as we mentioned earlier not just women also girls but of course, it's still concerning to see that the party waited until now, until he opposed leadership to take issue with these things. There you saw Senator Mullen say no one defended him, but you didn't criticize him either. You didn't raise the alarm earlier and allowed this behavior to continue to the detriment of you know the interns working on his staff, the women working on his team and on the teams of others that had to work with his office, the girls and his then women in his district. Now, going back a little bit to this battle with the leadership, the party is definitely turning on him. But apparently public opinion as far as ousting Kevin McCarthy is on his side because Newsweek reported that according to the 1913 adults surveyed by YouGov, 46% of American voters agree that McCarthy should have been ousted. Around 28% responded that they either disapproved or strongly disapproved of removing the former speaker. The results did not vary much across political parties. Over half of Democrats, 55% said they supported or strongly supported removing McCarthy compared to 45% of Republican respondents. And I do just want to give some context to that because they didn't ask, do you support Matt Gates? Do you support removing Kevin McCarthy for the reasons Matt Gates has lied out? So this isn't, you know, that most people support Matt Gates by any stretch of the imagination. If I had been polled on this issue, I would have said, yes, I support ousting Kevin McCarthy because I think it turns the Republican Party into an absolute circus and harms their chances in congressional races in 2024 and helps the Democrats. I think that it's good politically for the Democratic Party. I would have supported it. But if you ask me if I support Matt Gates, I would have said hell no in every way I possibly could have. So just to add some context to that. Um I it I don't know. I I'm feeling very cynical about these criticisms of him coming out now after the party has protected him for so long, knowing that he engaged in this behavior. Well, I mean, we know that um, it evidenced by so much thing, so many things that have happened in, throughout history is that women have never really mattered mm -hmm. uh, to the to the American government, only when it's appropriate to weaponize them in these moments where they can use this. Because if, if a man is walking around, you know, the Senate floor showing pictures of victims, you would think that someone with some decency would report it or would say mm -hmm. something about it. Not after the fact, because now he did something, you know, he's turning the 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 party on its head. You know, everybody has envied uh, the, uh, you know, AOC and, and, and company for so long that they've always tried to create their own version of that <laughs> within the Republican Party because they've been so impactful. Um, you know, I can't I, I'm I'm I'm. I'm very hungry, so I can't think right now. But you know, when when you think about the squad, you think about you know Ilhan and what those people, those significant contributions that Ayanna Presley, that Corey, um, uh, what's her? I'm sorry, Corey. I, I I can't think right now in St. Louis. The difference that they've made in um, in our American government has been so powerful, so impactful that you know they've been trying to create some version of this within the Republican Party. They've gone rogue. They want, they have agendas. They're also beholden to corporations and they're getting paychecks. And let, let's not the American people just be fooled about this to think that this is about principles mm -hmm. and this is about, 
uh, caring about the American people. This is just about agendas. And everyone now is fighting as dirty as they can, because no matter how dirty they get, there is a faction of this country that will still support them. Mm -hmm. And the people that they've been polling about the House, I would love for people to poll them and ask them, what are the three branches of government? Because <laughs> we are sitting here to a bunch of people sitting around talking about politics and American government that are not even receiving a basic education that grants them the information about how our government functions. So this you know, I'm done with these people. What I challenge is their employers, the American people, to say, what are you going to say at election time when these representatives here are asking you for your vote so that they can keep getting dollars from their, you know, their bosses, which are mm -hmm. the corporate heads? Are you going to still employ these people? Look at our government. Look what is happening right now. Your issues are at the are on the back burner. What's happening in your home today? Because I know you hate watch. What's happening in your home today is not an issue right now because this political theater that is playing out is just for position and power. Has nothing to do with your health care, your children's education, your safety, the, you going being able to go to a public place and feeling secure. None of that is being considered right now. You are on the back burner and you're going to continue to show up for these people. It is embarrassing what the American people have done to their employees. These are our employees. These are your servants. They work for you and they live way better lives than you and you allow them to do it. So what are you going to do? Right. And I've, I've brought this up a couple of times over the past few weeks. But when we were headed towards a shutdown, Matt Gates specifically said that 10,000 federal workers in his district are going to have to go without pay if the government shuts down and then went on to say, and I'm that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make on their behalf. To those 10,000 people living in his district, wake up, vote for someone else. This is a guy who's willing to, to continue to get paid through a shutdown and watch as you're forced to work your essential jobs without pay, to do volunteer work. And that is money you do not get back. That is money that you are just out. You got to, if you're, you know, an essential worker, if you work for the uh, FAA, if you're a TSA worker, you have to, the country can't function without you doing your jobs. The country can function damn well, probably better without Matt Gates. If he took some time off from Congress, we'd all be better off for it. But you have these essential jobs and he wants to continue to get paid and force you to work without getting a paycheck. And I just vote for someone else. Also, I really like the point you brought up about the squad because I remember a few years back, the Republicans really tried to push their, their new squad that was several Republican women who I never made a name for themselves in the party even. But it was so false and so fraudulent because they failed to understand what it is about the actual squad, about AOC, about Ilhan Omar, about Rashida Tlaib, about Cori Bush that it, that people are invested in. And it's the fact that these are uh, women of color who against all odds have been able to run amazing campaigns, grassroots campaigns, you know, based on you know, unabashed support of progressive policies, not, you know, for random white women from the Republican Party who have never beaten any odds, who have never, who don't support women, who didn't get to their positions based on grassroots fundraising, but were based on, you know, corporate dollars. They can't replicate that authenticity that the squad has because there's nothing authentic except for their bigotry about the Republican Party. And so it was just, it's so silly. <laughs> Yeah, my apologies to the beautiful black queen Cori Bush for forgetting her last name because I didn't have any uh, nutrients this morning, <laughs> um, knowing all of the impact that she's had and using her voice. But I, I just think that it's just it's a clown show. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Malcolm X called it the dog and pony show. We sitting here, we watching this political theater, all of this foolishness. And the American people continue to suffer. So I just say at every turn, American people, what are you going to do? Your, your employees are out of control. They're unruly. Use your power and get them out of there and replace them with people who give a damn about your well-being. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And especially as we're moving forward into this next election, it's more important than ever for people to get involved because people's lives literally depend on it. We're going to talk about that more coming up in our story about how red states are 
actively killing their constituents. <laughs> so uh, we got to go to a break now though, cause st but stick around because we're also going to give you some updates on Donald Trump's absolute disaster of the trial that's happening in New York. Bad for him, good for us. And we'll talk about that more on the other side. Mm -hmm. I know that you're talking about Donald Trump, but you could be talking about any of those fools. <laughs> <who> <laughs> put <that. laughs> uh, speaking of Donald Trump, let's talk about this trial. And and speaking of foolishness specifically, let's take a look at how Trump's been responding to his trial. I'm here stuck here. And the judge already knows what he's going to do. He's a Democrat judge. In all fairness to him, he has no choice. He has no choice. He's run by the Democrats. I know this city better than anybody knows this city. There's nobody knows it like I do. He's a Democrat judge out of the clubhouses. He's controlled, and it's a shame. What's going on here is a shame. Our whole system is corrupt. This is corrupt. Atlanta is corrupt. And what's coming That was a very red faced Donald Trump livid about how poorly this trial has been going for him. Now, we got to fact check something really quick because he said he was stuck there for the trial. And I have to point out, he has no obligation to be there. He doesn't have to be there until he's called to testify and that hasn't happened yet. He's just putting on a show so that he can push the framing that they're trying to interfere with the election, that they're trying to prevent him from being on the campaign. Campaign trail, which is absolutely not what's happening. He was found to have committed fraud, and now they're having a trial to determine damages. He did the crime. <laughs> it's not election interference. But speaking of the trial, let's go over a little bit of what's happened in the past three days. Now, Donald Trump's lawyers got in a fight with the judge overseeing the case arguing for their right to ask repetitive questions. And really quick, before I get into the details of that, I have to remind everyone, and I, I must be a broken record. Every time this week I've been on the show, I've brought this up. But this is a bench trial. The judge holds the fate of Donald Trump's ability to practice business in New York and the millions of dollars he's gonna be asked to pay back in the palm of his hand. And Trump is like, let me go on TV and call you an idiot. Let me go on True Social and insult you and your staff. <laughs> let me have my attorneys yell at you in the courtroom. I don't understand the legal strategy here, but <laughs> with that, let's talk about specifically what they're doing. An insider reported that New York Supreme Court Justice Arthur and Gorin, who's presiding over the trial, was having none of it. You're not allowed to waste time. He snapped at Trump's lawyers during one testy exchange. Really quick, I want to add just a bit of information for people who might not realize Supreme Court justice sounds, you know, like a very high position in New York. Not that it isn't a, a coveted position in law. In New York, that's not the highest court. That's the second highest court. The New York State Court of Appeals is what we would think of as the Supreme Court as far as structures go in other states and the way it is federally. But that's not the highest court. In, in, uh, in the state, just in case you read that and thought, how did he get it to that level? He didn't, <laughs> but let me continue on with this reporting from Insider. On Wednesday, Trump's attorney Jesus M. Suarez continued his cross-examination of Donald Bender, an outside accountant who had compiled the Trump Organization's statement of financial conditions until 2020. New York Attorney General's office, which is bringing the lawsuit, questioned Bender on Tuesday. Suarez asked about whether Bender and not Trump and his children would be responsible for the statements, which the Attorney General's office said included outrageous valuations that were fraudulently used to obtain bank loans. The move was a continuation of a strategy the Trump Organization's lawyer employed during an earlier criminal trial, trying to shift blame to Bender. The buck stops with you, right? Suarez asked. Bender stressed during multiple questions that he and his accounting firm, Mazars USA, was responsible for compiling the documents, but that the Trump Organization was responsible for giving them the market value and liabilities for each property. So just to sort of summarize what I just read for you, make it more digestible. What he's saying is that 
Trump provided him the information. He provided him the valuation of the assets. He said, this is worth this much money, this is worth that much money. And this man's job was just to put it together in a portfolio, not to make those valuations himself. But <laughs> to show you what type of circus Trump's legal team tried to turn this courtroom into, at one point, Suarez, Trump's attorney, pulled up a list of 200 corporate sub entities of the Trump Organization, many of which were just for particular apartments and started asking the same set of multiple questions about Bender's work on each one. Each one of those 200, he then went through the financial statements of each year of Bender's more than a dozen years of involvement with the Trump Organization and started asking the same question about each of them. And that is when Justice and Gorin lost it. Here's a quote, we're not going to go through each year, are we? And Gorin asked, no, I'm not gonna let you do that. And Gorin asked Bender whether his answer would be the same for each year. When Bender said yes, and Gorin asked Suarez to move on. What's the difference? And Gorin said, Jesus, now <laughs> now Suarez attempted to do this multiple times after and Gorin already scolded him for trying it in the first place. So much so that at one point the justice said, I don't just talk to hear the sound of my own voice. What I'm saying means something. He pounded on the bench and yelled. <laughs> that is how contentious this battle became between the two of them. Now, at the lunch break of this trial, Trump, despite the fact that he claimed was stuck there, effed off and went back to Florida. <laughs> and it was at this point that New York Attorney General Letitia James called Trump out for what he's been saying in the media. Let's take a look at that. Trump's comments were offensive, they were baseless, they were void of any facts and or any evidence. What they were, Comments that unfortunately fomented violence, and comments that I would describe as race baiting, and comments unfortunately that appeals to the bottom of our humanity. This case was brought simply because it was a case where individuals have engaged in a pattern and practice of fraud. And I will not sit idly by and allow anyone to subvert the law. And lastly, I will not be bullied. And so Mr. Trump is no longer here. The Donald Trump show is over. This was nothing more than a political stunt. And through all of this, Ida, it seems like Trump's attorneys are just as childish as he is. And the only arguments they're and their main argument in court is that this is a political attack on Donald Trump. They've sort of reiterated the racist rhetoric that he has espoused, claimed that the trial was based on race, that she was being an anti-white racist to him. The whole thing is just a disaster show, but he's using it to, you know. Promote to his, I think he described them as low intelligence voters. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Do that out of courtesy. Um, what they say is when you're accustomed to privilege, uh, equality feels like oppression. The people uh, in the state of New York are held to the same laws that everybody, you know, that Donald Trump is being held to. And all business owners are held to the same standard. Why he thinks that he shouldn't be held to the standard is just indicative of how elite he is in his mentality. And the people who follow him so closely and worship him don't realize that he does not see himself like them. Because if he did, he would stand trial and say, I'm an American. I want to be a good leader. I want to be a good citizen and I want to lead by example. And so if I did something incorrectly, then let's go. But he's not doing that because he doesn't feel like he should be beholden to the law because he does think that he is above everybody else. And he only calls on certain groups of people when he needs them and he uses them and then discards them. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think that this is in any way a departure from who Donald Trump has been. But this whole idea that that he is being persecuted is just his direct call and talk to white supremacists who are out there that are under the belief that people of color are trying to, uh, you know, oppress and and uh, apparently get some revenge for what's been done to people of color historically in this country for hundreds and hundreds of years. That you know. 
that uh, for some reason, these women are like banking everything on that. And it's just straight foolishness that the, this woman is risking her well-being with the rate of, of you know, violence in, in, in that in the world of hate crimes has is ridiculously through the roof that she trying trying to hold him to the law as she would anybody else is now being called a race, you know, a racist. Which is ridiculous to hear people say that, you know, people who Donald Trump is still running for president. Donald Trump is still leading as president. He still has a great number of people following him blindly. And he is, you know, he's also misinforming the public by saying that he's being held against his will, you know, and it's because he hasn't been able to find something that out is outdoing what he did his first run. People are no longer shocked. You know, fake news is old news now. All of the things that he did that were dynamic at the beginning have been normalized. So foolishness in our American government, it's not foolishness. It's just Thursday. So Mm -hmm. now as he tries to shock the country continuously with new things to say, new attacks, they're normal now, you know, Little hands, that's what you did. You brought all this foolishness about. You shocked the country. You got yourself where you needed to go. You did the the next season of The Apprentice within our American government, and now you are shocked that nobody is shocked anymore. But there's, we've already seen you have tantrums. We've seen you turn red. We've seen you make false accusations. We've we've seen you threaten people. We've seen you say, uh, give lies upon lies upon lies. Nobody's shocked anymore. You made it normal. So I'm sorry, you're going to have to figure out something else to do because nobody cares anymore. Right. And, you know, he's still trying to do the same old playbook, going to the rallies, saying, you know, increasingly incendiary things, but it's not getting the media attention. You're right. It's not getting the same media attention it did in 2016 because we've all seen this playbook before. America as a country has a life expectancy problem. People here are dying far too young in the world's richest country, despite the vast sums of money we spend on healthcare. While Americans are an outlier among industrialized countries, we can see that disparity represented just within the country itself between blue states and red states. So the Washington Post did a study on that disparity specifically and the results are very clear. And you probably have an idea of which party kills their constituents more through their actions. So the study examined three neighboring counties in three states. We have a chart showing them. There's one blue leaning in New York, a swing state in Pennsylvania, and a red leaning county, excuse me, in Ohio. And then there is the map. Now, WAPO chose these three counties because they're in three different political environments statewide while still being tied together through geography and their local economies, which have all struggled in the face of declining industrial jobs over the past decade. So let's talk a little bit about the the findings of this study. Ashtabula residents and Ashtabula is the county, the red county in Ohio, residents are much more likely to die young especially from smoking, diabetes related complications or motor vehicle accidents than people living in its sister counties in Pennsylvania and New York. And they compiled these graphs, which we can pull up to show the death rate trends compared to the party controlling state government. And you can see the disparities there between New York, Pennsylvania and Ohio. Now, You might be wondering how did this pattern play out during the pandemic? It held true during the the heart of the pandemic. We're not out of it, of course, it's still ongoing. But during the beginning and the heart of it before we had a vaccine, that pattern still held true when Ash Tabula residents died of COVID at a far higher rate than people living in the counties in New York and in Pennsylvania. And that should make sense to you because of the GOP's history spreading misinformation about COVID as well as vaccine hesitancy and championing championing, championing the idea that masks are tyrannical and that 
encouraging people to do isolation so as to stop the spread of COVID is an infringement on your individual liberties. Not letting someone's grandma die is the biggest affront to individual liberties that the Republican Party could imagine, I suppose. Now, if you're wondering where this disparity traces back to, like so many horrible things in this country, it traces back to Ronald Reagan. From the Washington Post study, state lawmakers gained autonomy over how to spend federal safety net dollars following Republican President Ronald Reagan's push to empower the states in in the 1980s. Those investments began to diverge sharply along red and blue lines with conservative lawmakers often balking at public health initiatives. They said cost too much or overstepped. And if we pull that graph up back for one second, you can see that they all start around the same place in 1980. In fact, the study noted that life expectancies in Ohio in 1980 were roughly the same as California in 1980. And now California has the second highest, the second highest life expectancy rate among all the states, only behind Minnesota. And Ohio is in the bottom fifth of all states and it's just quickly to clarify for anyone who's wondering how does you know how does death from cigarette related diseases motor vehicle accidents and diabetes relate back to parties it's because the republican controlled areas didn't want to implement public health measures that save lives that prevent that's cigarette taxes that's taxes on sugary drinks that's passing initiatives on on keeping the roadways safe, lowering speed limits, implementing seatbelt laws. They were reticent to do that. In fact, they fought off doing those things and it lowered the life expectancy of the people who live there because of it. And I know when I was going through this data this morning, I, you know, I expected the result of it to look something like this, but I was just shocked at how clearly you can see this disparity in life expectancy amongst these three counties that all have such similar economic and geographical conditions, but such a different quality of life for the people who live there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, as uh, I was reading about homelessness, and uh, you know, one of the things that they always relate correlate is homelessness with drug use, and they mm-hmm. they always attribute that to the coastal states. They, uh, you know, New York and California, they're liberal, but the numbers are staggering in in uh, red states, and the quality of life, which is what people in every state should measure, is their quality of life versus the quality of life of the people who represent them. Mm-hmm. And it, it doesn't matter if you're a firefighter, if you're a teacher, if you work at the cafeteria. In the school, your quality of life should be the best that it could possibly be right where you are. And it should be just as good as those people who wake up every morning to allegedly represent you. But when you hear this, you know, Ohio, which has a an astronomical rate of missing women, 35 black teens gone missing in Cleveland. Nobody knows where they are. We don't speak their names. It is not a national issue. When when we think about cigarettes and we think about these toxins and sugary drinks, you know how much money they make from these corporations and these checks that they get slid to them off to the side on the cut. I'm so tired of hearing people talk about my people and where I come from in the inner city as being thugs and gangsters. The biggest thugs and gangsters are over there in DC making these decisions, holding up the government, being foolish, disrespecting the law, disrespecting the American citizens. We have a problem. We have a serious problem in our government. They are killing Americans. They have, they've been doing it for a long time. Ronald Reagan sprinkling crack in our communities and then blaming us for it. It is unbelievable where we are now. And the fact that the American people are too busy trying to struggle to survive, they don't have the information because they're not getting the education. They are the greatest victims of all of this stuff that is happening. And again, I say to you, American people, get your employees because they are out of control. And just quickly to add on to that, 
Here in Chicago, the Republicans held a little conference about crime in Chicago, which is down incidentally, <laughs> which if you actually want to examine crime in Chicago, do it along economic lines. Look at the history of redlining in the city, the massive segregation that we still have in Chicago today. You know, people here, I was talking about two Chicago's, that still very much exists, the lack of economic opportunity on our south and west sides. But why didn't these Republicans take some time to investigate and so of crime in Chicago, why don't you do some investigation into the sex crimes of your own party members? Why don't you hold some investigations about that? Okay, we absolutely have to go to a break, but stick around because we'll be right back. And we're gonna talk about, speaking of Republican crimes, we're talking about one Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> Sometimes we miss some uh, some names and charge it to my head and not my heart. But the reality of it is, is that we have a missing people of color problem in the state of Ohio. I mean, we have one globally, but uh, yes. Yeah, so thank you for, for uh, mentioning that because it is important that we speak what's what matters to the people. That's what matters to us. They don't care. Mm -hmm. Please vote accordingly. Especially right now, as there was so much coverage about the little girl who was kidnapped in New York. And I think that's important, but why don't little girls of color, women of color get that same sort of coverage when they go missing? It's racism, it's plain and simple. Everyone should get that same sort of attention that that little girl got that got her home safely. How many lives could have been saved if we prioritize the lives of girls and women of color the same way we do of white people in the media? We gotta, we gotta be serious. We gotta wake up about that. We gotta call it what it is. It's racism. Yeah. Speaking of racists, let's talk about Rudy Giuliani, who is his his new approach to getting money. He's getting desperate. He's got these indictments. He's getting desperate. Uh, his new approach is suing Joe Biden. Take a look. Being called a Russian pawn and being called by uh, the leading candidate of the Democratic Party. A facilitator of Russian disinformation is an extraordinarily damaging thing. It may be that a lot of people don't believe him, but a lot of people do believe him. Go look at the public opinion polls. So those people believed that I was working with Putin. That is 100%, 1,000% untrue. Not only that, it's been proven untrue. Tell me you're desperate for money without telling me you're desperate for money. So mm -hmm. Rudy Giuliani is now suing Joe Biden, accusing him of defaming him three years ago. So this new lawsuit filed by Giuliani's lawyers, they're contending that Biden defamed Giuliani twice during a televised presidential debate with Donald Trump in 2020. So let's talk about what they're alleging. The lawsuit alleges that at two points during the debate, Biden falsely accused Giuliani of being a quote Russian pawn and dismissed Giuliani's criticism of his son Hunter's laptop, claiming that the ex mayor believed a bunch of garbage. Um, now, during the debate, Biden said Russia was feeding Giuliani false information to help Trump's chances of getting elected president, something that had been reported, um, something that Trump himself had been warned about at the time, but just to read the quotes specifically what Joe Biden said was they're interfering with American sovereignty. That's what's going on right now. They're interfering with American sovereignty. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think the president said anything to Russian President Vladimir Putin about it. He continued on. His own national security advisor told him what is happening with his buddy. Well, I shouldn't. Well, I will. His buddy Rudy Giuliani is being used as a Russian pawn. He's being fed information that is Russian that is not true. And then what happens? Nothing happens. And then you find out that everything is going on here about Russia is wanting to make sure that I do not get elected the next president. So a little bit more about this lawsuit. What? They're alleging, says defendant Biden knew that the pre preceding statement about the laptop and asserting that the plaintiff lied about the content of the laptop were untrue. While also charging that now Secretary of State Anthony Blinken had sought to discredit Giuliani regarding Hunter Biden's laptop. Now in the lawsuit, uh, it goes into the perceived damages Rudy has suffered for the statement made three years ago. But here, let's have Rudy tell it to you himself. Uh, his lies uh, cost me a good deal of my law practice. 
it cost me uh, directly uh, a good deal of my million person audience on uh, Common Sense where I was cut off by YouTube which operates as a uh, co-conspirator in another conspiracy of Biden's which is to suppress free speech um, it cost me clients in my consulting business I haven't calculated the amounts we can do that later but it's in the millions and billions of dollars <laughs> oh this man is so desperate for money and it's it's so reflective of of the Trump defense nothing that has the consequences that I'm having to stare in the face right now none of that could possibly be because of the things I did it's got to be someone else's problem and this time that someone is Joe Biden, I mean, it's ridiculous. I th- we all know it's ridiculous, but to see how far this man has fallen, it's it would be sad if he wasn't such a piece of garbage. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's called uh, when the chickens come home to roost. I'm I'm on the Mal- I'm on my Malcolm X today. Um, you know, all of that stop and frisk, all of the terror on black men. Black and brown men in the state of New York, all of the the racist uh, you know policies that were in place as a result of this man. This is karma. And the thing is that what's caused him all these dollars is his loss of credibility and respect. And on the trail and the heels of Donald Trump, the hair dye, the flatulence video, like all of that stuff. It is no, there's no respect anymore. No church in the wild, according to uh, as as Ye would say. It is unbelievably ridiculous how far he's fallen as a result of being negotiable and not having any decency. And now here you are begging people for money, looking like a fool based. You think people you've lost uh, your your business and your dollars because of being called the Russian pawn. You were called the Russian pawn by many for a very long time. You lost your you lost your credibility because you were running around looking like a fool behind Donald Trump because you were chasing them dollars. And now, now you out here, as the, as the kids would say, out here trying to with this ridiculous lawsuit. This is not even in defense of Joe Biden because I don't care about either one of these political parties. I care about the American people and the policies. This is just straight foolishness. And the fact that he gets airtime is what burns me the most because that is the airtime that could be used for things that are very important. As we talked about these people who have been missing, who are missing that we don't know where they are. They talking to Rudy Giuliani about his little foolish lawsuit because somebody called him a name and there are real things happening in America that should be getting coverage that don't because we uh, the news has turned into reality shows. Yeah, and it definitely helped inspired when we, when some American people allowed in our political system that is inherently undemocratic, allowed a literal game show host to become the president. And as you said, there's no church in the wild. There's also no honor amongst thieves because yeah. why does Rudy have to do this? Because he gave his entire life to Donald Trump and is Donald Trump got his back now? No, he doesn't. <laughs> is he helping to pay for his uh, his defense of in, in these lawsuits and these indictments? No, he isn't. He held one candlelight dinner for donors to raise money for Rudy Giuliani that was not advertised at all and did not make him very much <laughs> money. Um, but speaking of Rudy Giuliani, the other thing that he needed people to to know was that he denies the allegations that he has a drinking problem. (laughs) He said Giuliani's drinking long a fraught subject has Trump prosecutors attention. So let's hear what he says first and then go into the allegations. Now notice how his attorney on the left is desperate to end the press conference. It's a typical New York Times malicious lie. I do not have an alcohol problem. I have never had an alcohol problem. And the reason I told you what I achieved is Nobody could have achieved that if they did. When the hell was I drinking? I was working 24 hours a day. It's a big damn lie by a newspaper that's a disgrace. And by a reporter who covered me, used to cover me very, very, uh, in a very glowing way. And now is vicious and mean in what she does. Thank you. And it, uh, (laughs) it's my press conference. 
vicious and mean. And if it weren't for the protections that the press gets with Times Against Sullivan, I mean, she should be sued for libel. She should also be thrown out of the profession for being a damn liar. But that's okay. He was working for 24 hours a day. When did he have time to drink? Apparently, according to all accounts, during those 24 hours of the day. I mean, we don't have to get into the specific allegations because Rudy Giuliani's alcoholism is a long documented thing throughout so much of his time as a prosecutor, as mayor, as Trump's attorney. And it is just so funny to see him squealing like this when he knows that he's getting all this negative press. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for those of you watching on Linear. But stick around because we'll be back with the aftermath right after this. So hold on to your butts. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.